Cruise audience with me. Well, that's fantastic. Come on in. Nice to meet you. Thanks. All right, okay. Oh, wait a minute. You guys can come in too, so come on in. Well, you know, one of the things people ask me when they first come is like, how about a tour? Because the house does look kind of weird yeah. for Anaheim Hills. It's more like Toad Hall. Right. So maybe we should begin here. This is the right. living room. Um, and uh, one of the things that was really helpful for me as a designer in the beginning was to use the same tools I do at Disney, which was to build a model of the house. So it was also fun when I didn't quite have the funds to do this, to be able to look at it and dream. And so for three years, I would dream looking at this model. and I. I could actually pull the roof off and develop the rooms, and it was really cheap to deal with just foam right. core and move it around rather than having to tear down uh, walls. And later, I found that when you're dealing with contractors, like a roofing contractor, it really helped to have something they could look at that was practical. It's probably something they don't have often. No, uh, and it's something, of course, we don't do anything at Disney without a model, right. so it was... Uh, it was kind of exciting. Now, this is around the time that you were working on Disneyland Paris? You were was, I started before, I did the model before, and then we got heavily into the build it, uh, building of this right during the Paris project. And what was neat was there were great hardware stores over there. <laughs> and I ended up buying like door hardware and outside chimney pots and stuff in Paris, yeah. you know, for this house. So it was an opportunity that probably was the best time of my life. So when I transitioned into my advisory role at Imagineering, they gave me this beautiful copy of the castle we built over in Paris, and it's just gorgeous, the detail and everything. I think they could definitely sell these if they made it as a product, but I think this is one of a kind. And the other great thing was getting honored with a window on Main Street, because um, that's something that's very special to me, because all the people that are at the Disneyland windows are people that I grew up with that, um, as a child, I dreamed of being with Claude Coates and Mark Davis and John Henshin. And so that means something to me to be with, treated as a peer to these people that were really part of my, uh, the whole inspiration for me. With all the that. honors, the Disney Legend Award, the few awards, yeah. this has to be. It is, it's one. very special. And what you're looking at here is a miniature. It's like half scale of the five eight scale window that's at Disneyland. But um, you know, it, you don't want to find yourself walking down Main Street and looking at your window. So it's really nice that I can, in the secrecy of my own home, I can look at my window. And for those who want to know where your window is, I think it's the coolest location ever above the Magic Shop. Yeah, I don't think they could have picked a better place. Yeah. And I love the, the idea of what they came up with because it's got a little bit of a throwback to Journey into Imagination. Yeah. We'll move on. Uh, I once had a dining room. You know, normal houses have dining rooms. Right. I kind of have a time machine room. Because where else would you keep your time? Yeah, in? so this room is devoted to Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and this is a time machine. I'm doing a little work on it right now, so there's a few things around the, the dish in the back that are in, in rehab, as we call it at Disneyland. Um, so, but everything in here is something from uh, the stories of H.G. Wells or uh, Jules Verne and so forth, things that have meant a lot to me uh, of that period. I'm, I think I'm a... Uh, I was born in the wrong century. I love mechanics more than I do computer sciences. Yeah. So, um, so we'll go on through. Uh, just your normal kitchen with acorn lamps <laughs> lighting it. Uh, we'll move right on from that into here, which is kind of fun because um, I guess Walt really inspired me with his love of trains. And so the lily bell was something that was almost unobtainable, but I found a woman who had all the rights to Walt's patterns that were developed at the studio. And so she was still alive about 20 years ago. And so I bought all the kit parts to build this. And I got it about up that far. This is a copy of the Lily Bell. I actually have a Lily Bell plaque that I called my train uh, Thunder Mountain Railroad because that's a little bit more personal to me. Sure. But uh, anyway, I got up to about there. When we got to boilers, that's beyond me. I don't do boilers, so I had a uh, but I've got a lot of the models of the Disney trains. And then uh, there's Drew Struson's poster for the Indiana Jones ride. When you spend like four years with a concept like Indy, you kind of fall in love with it. So I think I've got every Indy collectible that one can imagine. And they, they keep coming out with them, even now, like 20 years later. We'll spend a lot of time here tonight in this room because this is our TV room. I wanted a space that looks really cool as kind of a family room during the day. 
but then I can quickly bring down a screen on the end wall there. So I thought you oh, might like to see capture. this. Yeah, beautiful. This piece was done for the Disneyland Paris Castle, and uh, I loved it. And it was it was actually woven on the same in the same uh, studios that did tapestries four or five hundred years ago. And they'll only make like six of anything. And this one is number two. And the first one is in the castle, and the other four don't exist. So um, this is it. So you'd have to go to Paris to actually see this hanging up in, in our Delavoye de Rouen. Gorgeous. Uh, so I put all my evil people, since it's sort of the theme for the room. And, uh, I love Godzilla and some of the other studio props, but Maleficent is probably my favorite villain of all time. It's one of the few models remaining of the dream vehicle from Journey into Imagination at Epcot. And uh, it was given to Disneyland on their 30th anniversary. They gave me uh, this from Disneyland, so it actually came as a present from Disneyland. So, so I love your Rocketeer helmet. Yeah, Rocketeer, the coolest Disney character. Yeah. I wish we'd do more of those. So why don't we do the series of three of those? Yeah, then his successor, Captain America. So um, I could probably have gotten to the art gallery and okay, show you stuff up there. I've got some really cool stuff upstairs because I love collecting Disney art, so we'll have to get up there to, to find those. Most people have bedrooms, right? Well, I have an art gallery, so in my art gallery, I try to really concentrate the majority of my Disney stuff into this room. So. Well, I have time machines and everything from everywhere else. Here, it really is devoted to my love with Sleeping Beauty and probably the most incredible science fiction uh, object that's ever been created in the Nautilus, which Harper Goff did for Disney's 20,000 Leagues. Um, so here you see about 10 of my Nautilus and a copy of the book that opens the film that you see Walt Disney holding this in the television show. And it's uh, on camera when the curtains part at the start of the movie. Amazing detail. I end up like loving this one, and then I find somebody comes up with one that has lights in it. You can see the organ and everything inside, so I have to buy it all over again. But the main, I think, collection in here is I have admired Disney backgrounds since I was a kid. I think it's wonderful. We often give so much credit to the animation, but uh, I think being a ride designer, it's a chance to let people go into the worlds that were created on film and the characters we love in the movies, but in the rides, we get to go into these places. And I think for me, Sleeping Beauty uh, and Ivan, Ivan Earl's artwork was a high water mark for Disney, so I spent a lot of time collecting his pieces. And some of the things on this wall were actually used in the film. Others are pre-production art that was done in, uh, you know, establishing what it was going to look like, but this was actually a major scene in the film where Aurora goes to the edge of the forest. Um, one up here is interesting because it was shot twice. Uh, Philip rides to the uh, uh, little cottage in one point, and the three fairies come later in the film, so it was used a couple of times. In the center of all the Sleeping Beauty pieces is uh, the Chateau de la Belle of Bois de Mont. I apologize for my really bad friend. This was created for Disneyland Paris. It's the poster you'd see in the park. And for me, it represents kind of one of the best things I ever got to do in my career at Disney, which was uh, lead the effort creatively in Paris. But I think Tom Morris and uh, Tracy Trinis, who uh, designed this, came up with the perfect blend between something that's French, it has that historic look of uh, the early turn of the century uh, artwork, but it also looks like Disney. And I think that combination uh, is what we were looking for, and it, it just nailed it. And so I've put it there as, as a centerpiece of my collection is kind of the crowning uh, element. You know, your bedroom is a place you spend a lot more time than anywhere else, so I always had this thing, I had to be looking at really cool stuff, so that started when we were building the house. I actually self-contracted, and when we got to really intriguing things like this fireplace, I actually did some of the handwork myself, because when we built Big Thunder and we did Splash Mountain, I kind of learned how to do the carving of cement and turning it into the looking like stone. So uh, the one thing I didn't do was that head. I plopped that in and kind of blended all the cement around it. And on Monday when all the, the construction workers came back, they said, you carved that? I go, yeah, I'm really good, aren't I? You know? So also down below are the, the maquettes that were used in the movie uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, which kind of goes with all this too. I have a lot of Indiana Jones stuff, but I think probably one of my favorite things 
is this rough sketch is one of Drew Struson, who's the other great poster artist. There's Bob Peak and Drew. Drew did all the indie posters and Star Wars and Back to the Future and Harry Potter. But this is one of his um, early concepts for Indiana Jones. This is kind of fun because some friends of mine work at a studio that he scans your head. Does he look familiar? Yeah, that looks like me. It actually made me look better than I look. So whatever their computer is that carves these things, uh, I like that. Oh, my head fell off. lost your head. Yeah, we'll find out later. Um, over on this wall, going back to the dawn of animation, uh, this is a, a frame from the first recognized kind of animated film, which was Gertie the Dinosaur. Is that Windsor McKay? It's a Windsor McKay, and they didn't have cells, so they had to do the entire background and the character for each frame. So if you were shooting 16 or 24 frames, there are literally, you know, 24 drawings complete, completed to do that. Down the Disney Hollywood Studios, the Gertie the Dinosaur's Ice Cream of Extinction. Has been yes, the yeah, it is. Yeah. So, you know, I kind of look at it and saying, if that film hadn't happened, where would we all be, right. <laughs> you know? And down below, again, this probably should have gone downstairs with my bad guys, but Schoenbach hasn't completely unfolded yet. But this was by the artist Kai Nielsen who directed that whole sequence in the in the film and has always been, if you look at it, the Art Deco styling of that is just really beautiful. And I wish it was unfolded a little more, but you can't, when you get a chance to find something like that, you have to sure. go with it. And the oldest thing that I have in this room is, for me, is this castle model up here, which uh, I did when I was 15. And I think it still lights up. Let me see if I can get a few of the lights to, to turn on. But it was in my mom's garage and when she passed away, I saw it there all covered with the dust, and I cleaned it up. And lo and behold, some of the lights came on when I turned the switch. So uh, I did it. She was a school teacher, and I made it out of construction paper and uh, plaster of Paris and things that you'd find around the house, and little toothpicks for the finials and so forth. It looks okay from the front. If you saw the back of it, you'd really know that I didn't have any research. But who knew back but, then that someday you would create? No, my mom said it really. Looked, real Disney Park. She thought it looked real, really nice, and she said, "Let's enter it in the Orange County Fair," and we did. And I got a blue ribbon, and in the paragraph about winners in the uh, hobby division, it was you know blue ribbons. And I got my name in the paper. Very that cool. was very exciting. <laughs> Hey, Ryan, you know, there's one more thing I want to show you before we go in. It's certainly got to be the biggest souvenir that's ever been taken from Disneyland. But these olive trees stood in the hub in the park from opening day until our 50th anniversary. And when they were coming out for the fireworks show, I said, I have got to save those. Probably more people have taken pictures of these trees than any in the world. And um, now we're actually getting a view of it again that you guys are all seeing. Uh, but when we moved them up here, we had to cut them way back, and you can see where it was chopped from uh, being at Disneyland. But nature takes over. It's already replaced that with a brand new branch here. How'd you get the trees from Disneyland to here? That must have been a Well, you know, there's one chore. crane big enough to park out on the street and literally lift them over my house into this property on the side here. So uh, the neighbors thought I was crazy. But, you know, I figured when Walt created Disneyland, he put in these 50-year-old trees that were now 100 years old at the 50th. And I just couldn't see him going. So uh, actually, Michael Broby did a really nice plaque for these that talk about these standing mm -hmm. in Disneyland for 50 years. So uh, here they are, and they're still Gorgeous. enjoying Anaheim. <laughs> and we're still in the same city. So it's kind of neat to have yeah. literally the biggest souvenir from Disneyland ever. <laughs> you believe it. One of the other trees I really wanted you to see, I'm kind of sentimental about this mm -hmm. one, because when I worked at Disneyland, sometimes they'd have me go out and work the popcorn cart in the hub. And this is where it stood, right about where we are. It's 15 cents for popcorn back then. But I actually still have a picture, and you can really see this branch up here behind it. And it's me with my grandma back in about 1968, standing right in front of this tree. And who would ever think when you're a kid that that's going to be in your front yard? Right. You know? So here it is. It's amazing. Yeah. And uh, again, I haven't rewired it completely yet, but one of these days I'll get around to it. So let's go in and see some movies. All right, great. Okay, sounds good. Come on in, everybody. You're all invited. Pick a seat and have some vanilla taffy as traditional. Somebody call out a number. Any number between one, six. 
Disc number six at Disneyland. 1955. Pretty cool, Tim. You picked a good one. All right. Could have gone all the way up to the 80s, but we get the, the four disc times open. That's pretty cool. Who has an idea for the next one? Anywhere from 25. That sounds like a good one. Okay, so this one. That's not right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, who's going to call it out this time? Well, it's not 55, but it's pretty interesting. There is some boat about to come down in a pirate ride. Yeah, there's somebody wandering around up there. That's more excitement than they've had in years. <laughs> All right, let's do another another 40 boats. You want up for it? Yeah. Oh, slow motion, too, huh? And you know, they use these over and over again. So we have the opening of Lincoln with the same cheers that don't work. <laughs> he couldn't even rip it. Let's see. Who hasn't who hasn't done one yet? Ryan, you haven't you haven't really asked for anything. Tony, I think we have a little problem. Uh oh. Someone's had a little too much happiness today. Uh, oh no. Well, I guess everybody this is good night then. Good night, Ryan. Wake up, Ryan. Is that him snoring? <laughs>